Our first speaker today is, in fact, of course, the recipient of the 2017 Shorenstein Award, uh, Siddharth Varadarajan. Uh, um, he is the founding editor of uh, a wonderful online Indian publication, The Wire. Uh, I don't know, I have to ask him whether he consciously uh, was evoking uh, the TV show of David Simons of the same name, uh, one of my favorites, um, which includes quite an interesting examination of the role of journalism, among other things. But in that case, I was referring to wiretapping rather than <laughs> to, to, the, to the supply of news. In any case, um, he founded this website in 2015 with uh, Siddharth Bhatia and M.K. Venu, is it Venu? And uh, it is a if you ha it's also available both in, in English and in Hindi and in, in Urdu, and it is a vibrant uh, source of news, not only about Indian uh, news developments in the domestic sense, but also about Indian foreign policy and India's role in the world. And uh, as a result, I believe it has made him a uh, frequent target uh, of the Indian government, uh, which is not always happy with what's, what can be read there. But I think as readers, we're all very happy that it's there. Uh, he came there from being the editor of the Hindu. And those of you who are familiar with the Indian media scene know that the Hindu is a great newspaper. Um, I gather that uh, he, he was too successful as the editor of the Hindu, such that there was a lot of pressure to remove him from that post. Um, but uh, he, so he has a long, I think, uh, involvement uh, in journalism in, in India. He came there out of some uh, background in academia. Uh, he taught economics at NYU at New York University. Uh, he spent a little bit of time across the Bay uh, at the School of Journalism at uh, UC Berkeley. Um, he worked also previously at the Times of India uh, and at the Center for Public Affairs and Critical Theory at the Shivnadar University. Uh, he has written widely on uh, both domestic issues such as anti-Muslim violence as well as uh, Indian foreign policy. And uh, I think that uh, he's a, someone who can range across uh, a full scale of issues, but certainly the one which we've asked him to talk about today, which is it, sort of Indian foreign policy in the construct, this geopolitical construct uh, of, that we see now in Asia of a rising China and a perhaps a retreating uh, United States. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction, uh, Don. And, uh, Dan, and thank you very much to um, the uh, selection committee of the award. Uh, this is a great honor for me. Uh, and I dare say um, a boost to those of us in India who are uh, fighting the good fight of keeping independent journalism alive and kicking under difficult circumstances. Uh, so um, I'm truly grateful uh, for the award and, of course, for the opportunity to come here and share my uh, thoughts with you uh, at this session, of course, on foreign relations between India, China, and the U.S., uh, and later this evening on the state of the Indian media. When, um, when Don was um, trying to figure out a suitable topic for this afternoon session, uh, I was keen, uh, I was clear that I wanted to um, talk about something connected with Indian foreign policy, because as uh, as a reporter, um, my, my best years and my, my um, happiest moments were when I was covering um, Indian diplomacy, Indian foreign relations, world affairs. Uh, I had uh, a great opportunity earlier when I was at the Times of India, later at the Hindu, to um, track a number of important world events and events uh, as far as Indian foreign policy is concerned. And a high point of that was the India-US nuclear deal, which was initially signed in 2005, 
by Manmohan Singh and, uh, and George W. Bush, uh, and whose implementation uh, is still carrying on uh, more than a decade later. Um, so I was clear that I wanted to talk about uh, Indian foreign policy. And it seemed to me that India, China, Russia, India, China, and the US, and, and the triangular relationship was uh, a suitable topic. Uh, Don, of course, uh, raised the question of the fact that the triangle has been around <laughs> for a long time. Uh, so what's new about the triangle? And uh, that got, you know, I was, uh, you know, it's a fair question. Because uh, at least since 2003, 2004, uh, and certainly after 2005 when George W. Bush decided to reverse America's long-standing position on uh, India as a nuclear weapon state, the world in general and Asia in particular have been looking at geopolitics through this prism of the triangular relationship between the three countries. And uh, even though the triangle has been around, and it's, so it's an old triangle, the newness that I detect of late, and that's what I want to speak about, is uh, the dilemma that this triangular relationship poses for India at a time when each of the three elements of the triangle um, have a strong element of flux, unpredictability uh, about them. China today is very different, both in terms of its internal arrangements with uh, President Xi Jinping essentially being president for life. Uh, this is a, st a stunning reversal of what has been settled practice for over two decades, two and a half decades. And this change in Chinese domestic policy is mirrored by um, a number of disturbing de developments on its foreign policy front. India is today ruled by a uh, government that takes a very different view from the so-called Nehruvian consensus that has governed Indian foreign policy for five or six decades. And of course, its domestic uh, uh, policies um, are a source of concern for many people in India, but also, I dare say, around the world. And that's, that adds an element of uncertainty into the uh, region and the triangular relationship. And of course, the third variable, the third unpredictable element or factor is the United States. Uh, and what is happening to US foreign policy, what's happening to US trade policy under uh, President Trump. And I think that the, the newness that, the new situation that these three leaders have, have brought into their domestic setup and the impact this is having uh, in terms of foreign policy uh, makes uh, a renewed look at the India-US-China triangle uh, an urgent, a task of urgent necessity. And that's, that's essentially what I want to do. Uh, the way I will approach uh, this subject is um, to look at, you know, my talk will essentially consist of four parts. I will quickly talk you through the uh, India-US relationship and how it's evolved over the last decade and a half, then focus on the uh, India-China relationship, uh, thirdly look at some of the changes that have happened in Chinese policy over the last seven or eight years, and uh, at the end look at the US-India response uh, and uh, try to make sense of some of the elements that have come into stark relief, like the Quad, and have some discussion or some assessment about uh, the kind of strategy that the US and India and 
countries like Japan and Australia in Asia appear to be following and make sense of what the logic is and what the likely consequences of their uh, new arrangements might be. And let's start with the, uh, the India-US relationship. If I were to broadly <laughs> categorize the last um, two decades uh, into three parts, and I'll start, I'll start with 1998 as uh, a significant moment in Indian foreign policy and in terms of India-US relations, which is the year that India decides to um, explode five nuclear devices and declare itself a nuclear weapon state. Uh, what followed was U.S. sanctions, uh, a downturn in uh, India-U.S. relations. The letter that Atal Bihari Vajpayee wrote to, to Bill Clinton explaining the rationale behind India's tests and which foolishly made a reference to uh, a Chinese threat. I say foolishly because you can't seriously expect such a letter to be kept confidential. And the Clinton administration promptly leaked it. And uh, that led to uh, further exacerbation of India-China relations. Uh, and you had, after the 98 tests, uh, and a, about a year and a half when the U.S. came to grips with the fact that India was unlikely to, that the fact that India had tested meant there was no turning back. There was no putting the genie back into the bottle. So after wasting about a year and a half and trying to get India to accept this restraint or that restraint, uh, you had these painful talks between Strobe Talbot and Jaswan Singh, which went nowhere, um, uh, essentially aimed at getting India to accept limitations via signing the CTBT, uh, accepting commitments on the Fissile Material Cutoff Treaty, none of which went anywhere. Uh, you then had a change of government in the U.S. George W. Bush comes to power. And... Uh, the Iraq war and the aftermath of the Iraq war, when India came quite close to sending troops to support uh, the American, uh, quote-unquote, pacification uh, after the invasion, but balked at the last minute uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, but w the Indian decision to countenance, or the, the Indian willingness to countenance bailing the U.S., helping the U.S. out in Iraq, but then backing off at the last minute, uh, raising various objections having to do with the nature of the India-U.S. relationship, the fact that India was still subject to all kinds of technology denial regimes by the U.S., prompted new thinking in, uh, in the United States, particularly under George W. Bush with Condoleezza Rice uh, uh, in the, as, as, as NSA, that uh, maybe a grand deal or a grand bargain with India was desirable uh, that would somehow unlock the Indian reluctance to be a partner with the U.S. Uh, in every field, including in the field of security and military security. And essentially, the Bush administration uh, hits upon the nuclear deal as this device that can unlock the full potential of the India-U.S. relationship. Uh, we now know from statements made at the time, but also subsequent statements made by people like Blackwell, others who were instrumental in this chapter of the India-U.S. relationship, that a major element in American decision-making at the time was uh, to bet on India as a hedge against uh, rising China. Uh, today, no, no scholar seriously disputes uh, this important element uh, as an ingredient in, in Bush's approach towards India. Uh, and the Indians reciprocated, and you had, uh, uh, beginning from uh, 2004, 2005 onwards, uh, a, a new period in, in India-U.S. relations that continue more or less um, till the early years of the Obama administration, where you have um, a lot of um, a huge increase in trade, huge increase in Indian uh, military purchases from the U.S. Uh, of course, the nuclear deal does not fructify, and it's instrumental. To, it's important to note that even today, after um, 13 years, uh, no ground has been broken for any U.S. nuclear reactor in India, and there's you know, reasons for that. Uh, but essentially, with the coming of Obama and Obama's ambiguity in his initial years about reaching an agreement with, with the Chinese. There was all the heady talk of G2, if you, if you recall 2009, 2010. 
Uh, you then have a downturn in India-US relations, or rather a plateauing. So the improvement that was seen before that comes to an end, and you have a, a lengthy sort of holding pattern emerging in, on the Indo-US front. Uh, reversals in some cases of uh, the Americans expected, for example, India to award the contract for the purchase of 100 plus uh, fourth generation fighter aircraft to an American company. That contract never came. It went instead to the French. Uh, the US is very keen that India sign um, agreements like the uh, logistics, uh, the LSA, the logistics supply agreement that would facilitate uh, ease easier interoperability between the US and American, US and Indian militaries uh, when, when the US military wanted to operate in, uh, off in the Indian Ocean region. There was a lot of Indian resistance to that and essentially you have a plateauing out of relations uh, with, uh, with India that carry on more or less till the election of President Donald Trump. And uh, with the coming of Trump, India-US relations entered a, a new phase, a third phase. India is perhaps the only major power or the only, only, only large uh, uh, country in the world to uh, view Trump's election uh, as a highly, as a positive development, even though Indian foreign policy establishment was betting on a Hillary Clinton win and were as surprised as everybody else. But uh, the Indian establishment very quickly uh, saw Trump and the statements he was making as uh, particularly on China, but also on Pakistan, as something that would work in India's interest. And when the rest of the world was ambiguous, ambivalent, uh, a bit worried about what the US might do under Trump, uh, Prime Minister Modi was one of the few world leaders to actually uh, seek a doubling down of the relationship. So India bet more heavily uh, on, the, uh, on the US relationship. And of course, you have uh, uh, Indian willingness to embrace um, the Quad, which is a, a, a renewed initiative by the Trump administration. Uh, there's a lot of heady talk of the Indo-Pacific region and India and the US working together to deal with the uh, threat of China. If I move to the second part, India-China relations, I'll quickly talk you through the trajectory. Uh, 98 to 2003. Uh, which is the uh, post-nuclear test period. Uh, in India-China relations are, you know, the, the general graph is downward, uh, downward sloping. Uh, but Vajpayee in 2003 makes a conscious effort to repair the relationship. Uh, we reach a landmark agreement with the Chinese on the recognition of the Tibetan Autonomous Region uh, as an integral part of China, and the Chinese uh, accept Sikkim as an integral part of India, and you have also, more importantly, uh, an agreement to elevate the process of finding a solution to the boundary dispute uh, to the political level. So until that point, uh, the uh, efforts to solve the boundary dispute revolved around unprodu largely unproductive official level meetings. Uh, with Vajpayee, uh, the decision came to, to create the category, to create the mechanism of special representative or, the, or SRs who would be empowered to negotiate on the boundary and take decisions. Uh, and that, uh, in some ways, uh, you know, uh, gave a positive boost to the uh, relationship with China. But again, after the nuclear deal, when it became clear in Beijing that uh, an important element of the India-US uh, relationship was this idea of hedging against China or containing China, uh, India-China relations again took uh, uh, a downward dip. The cooling off or plateauing of relations with the US after Obama comes to power is mirrored by uh, some sort of improvement with the Chinese. This is the period from 2009, 2010 onwards when Manmohan Singh works very closely with the Chinese on BRICS. Uh, or you have the Russia and the China Forum. Uh, you have Indian support for the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank uh, and various other uh, efforts to work with the Chinese, uh, whether on climate change or other issues. Uh, and that period of bonhomie and improvement of relations with the Chinese comes to a halt around 2014 with the election of Narendra Modi. Uh, Modi, as I said, represented uh, a conscious attempt to break with uh, 
the Nehruvian consensus, and if, if you're familiar with Indian domestic politics, a central tenet of critics of Nehru and Nehruvian policy is the idea that Nehru messed up India's relations with China by being weak, by, being, uh, by not being decisive, uh, and uh, Modi was expected to bring a more muscular approach uh, towards India's relations with China. He also began uh, to invest once again in the so-called Tibet card, the head of the Chinese, uh, of the Tibetan uh, so-called government in exile was invited as a, as a, as a guest to Modi's swearing-in. Uh, and there were various other, uh, I would say, not very well thought out uh, initiatives taken at different levels by people connected to the BJP, uh, which uh, gave the impression to the Chinese that India was actively uh, looking at uh, playing the Tibet card or roiling the Tibet question once again. Uh, you then... Uh, this becomes a, an important factor in, uh, a, in, in the downturn in relations with, with China. Of course, Chinese opposition to Indian membership of the nuclear supplies group uh, is an important, um, became an important negative factor as far as India was concerned. You had a, a couple of border incursions, the most serious of which, uh, there was a serious border incursion when President Xi was visiting India. Uh, so even as he was swinging on a swing with Narendra Modi in, in Ahmedabad, uh, you had the standoff uh, that uh, was not getting resolved very easily. And then, of course, last year, uh, this lengthy standoff at Doklam in Bhutan, where the Chinese essentially ingressed into Bhutanese territory. The Indian army uh, entered Bhutan in order to assist the, the Bhutanese. The Bhutanese, of course, uh, not very forthcoming in terms of their endorsement of the Indian position. Uh, but nevertheless, a lengthy standoff is resolved finally uh, with the Chinese moving back and Indians also coming out uh, of that region. And today, I would say an uneasy calm prevails at Doklam and in general. Uh, if you uh, uh, um, uh, look broadly at the India-China relationship, it's a textbook case, I suppose, just like the China, sorry, if you look at the India-China relationship, it's a textbook case of uh, how improvements in economic relations, improvements in trade, uh, do not necessarily lead to uh, uh, you know, improvements in, in political relations. Japan-China is, of course, another good example. But today, there is uh, uh, more distrust uh, and, and greater, um, a greater sense that existing arrangements uh, will have to be re-examined. Shiv Shankar Menon, former NSA, speaks in terms of a new modus vivendi. Uh, uh, um, being the order of the day as far as India and China are concerned, that <clears throat> assumptions that both countries had made about each other uh, in the last two decades uh, today have to be rethought. Uh, increasingly, India and China are uh, rubbing up against each other in uh, different parts of Asia, but particularly in South Asia. And uh, the Indian opposition, India is perhaps the only large part to come out openly against the Belt Road Initiative or the One Belt one road, largely because of our objections to the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which runs through uh, part of uh, occupied, uh, of Indian occupied, uh, sorry, of Pakistan occupied Kashmir, and uh, or POK, the, the road essentially uh, enters into, into Gilgit, uh, and which is part of the undivided state of JNK, which uh, uh, essentially is under Pakistani occupation. And India regards this element of the uh, Belt Road Initiative as a violation of Indian sovereignty and hence has taken a view uh, that is negative. Uh, India has broadened its opposition to also speak in terms of the unilateral nature of the BRI. Uh, and you have multiple suggestions being made by the former Indian Foreign Secretary Jay Shankar, but also by the Indian Prime Minister and by the Indian Foreign Minister Sushma Swaraj that uh, the arrangements that the Chinese are creating are unilateral, that they might end up saddling some of the countries who are part of the initiative with unsustainable debts and so on and so forth. Uh, turning to the third part of my, uh, of my, my brief talk, um, I spoke about changes, in, in changes within China itself, and uh, you have the internal arrangements of, of Xi, and of course, uh, China accentuating its border disputes with, with, with Japan, with the ASEAN countries, with Vietnam, with Korea, with India, pretty much all at the same time. Um, 
you have also, and this is something which the Indian side sees very negatively, Chinese making economic and even political inroads in the Indian periphery. So in virtually every Indian neighbor, uh, the uh, Chinese have a very active um, foreign policy and economic policy. Uh, and in the case of Nepal, in the case of Maldives, in the case of Sri Lanka, have actually worked to worked with elements that um, are um, uh, critical of the Indian role in South Asia. So India definitely sees uh, a, a method in Chinese in China's South Asia policy. Uh, and then you have Indian worries over naval expansion, the PLAN, and uh, the fact that the uh, Chinese are looking to enhance their presence in the Indian Ocean region. This becomes a, a further factor of negativity. And I have just a minute and a half left, so let me quickly rush through. Uh, the the U.S. India uh, response. I mean, broadly speaking, the uh, uh, U.S. and India are now part of what's called the Quad, which is uh, the cornerstone of um, a new attempt to deal with the rise of China, to counter China, to contain China, depending on your point of view, to uh, if you listen to American arguments to reassure countries in Asia who are worried about the rise of China and worried about the extent of U.S. commitment to Asia, that the U.S. is very much here to stay. Uh, this was also a message that Obama tried to send through his pivot, but not really in a very consistent manner. Uh, Trump has pulled back on the economic front by withdrawing from TPP, although there's talk now in the context of his trade war with the Chinese of going back to and re-examining if the TPP might work in America's interest. But on the uh, political, military, strategic front, it's very clear that uh, the U.S. is more open in, in identifying uh, China as a rival, as a problem for the U.S., as somebody that wants to actually displace the United States from the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, from the Indian point of view, uh, the Quad has been welcomed by Modi. The earlier avatar, uh, when, when uh, largely at uh, Shinzo Abe and Taro Aso's uh, urging, when the Quad was launched uh, a decade ago, uh, India was somewhat reluctant and worried about the kind of message that uh, this arrangement would send. And finally, the Quad was launched, didn't get very far, and was abandoned. This time, there seems to be greater political capital invested in it. Uh, by all the four countries, but also by the Prime Minister of India and the Indian establishment. But somewhere down the line, there are uh, a few reservations, which I will flag before ending, and perhaps we can elaborate on this uh, in the discussion period. Uh, the first is that uh, the Trump foreign policy in the Asia-Pacific region, but also broadly speaking at the global level, to the extent to which it involves renewed pressure on Russia, uh, there is a fear in India that uh, this will make it more likely that Russia and China will uh, act in concert uh, in the security sphere. And this is not an outcome that India relishes. It's not an outcome that India looks forward to. Uh, India's relations with Russia are themselves uh, undergoing a transition of sorts. Uh, but it, at any rate, uh, a tighter embrace in the strategic field between China and Russia uh, is not something that uh, India looks at in a very positive manner. Secondly, all the U.S. talk of the Indo-Pacific essentially conceives of this region as stretching from India in the west up to Japan and the wider Pacific in the east. However, if we speak of the Indian Ocean or maritime issues that concern or animate India, uh, yes, an increasing amount of our trade heads eastwards uh, and uh, goes through the South China Sea, but a lot of that trade is actually headed for Chinese ports. But the Indian uh, maritime dilemma uh, has a lot to do with what happens in the western part of the Indian Ocean, in particular the Arabian Sea. Uh, for us, the uh, primary challenge in the, in the strategic sphere on the western side is, uh, is Pakistan, Pakistan's sponsorship of uh, low-intensity conflict with India, sponsorship of terrorist groups, uh, the fact that Pakistan is unwilling to allow India to play its rightful role in um, uh, the development of Afghanistan by blocking uh, transit uh, uh, trade, you know, uh, trade routes that land routes for trade uh, to Afghanistan, forcing India to develop the Chabahar facility in Iran. Uh, 
so the ambiguity about where what the US policy towards Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, uh, the uh, heightening or the, the uh, renewal of tension between India, between the US and Iran is again something that uh, is uh, not a positive development from the Indian perspective. Uh, and uh, I think that this, uh, uh, these are some of the factors which are in a way holding back, I mean the Indian, the Modi government has embraced uh, uh, the broad Trump policy for the Indo-Pacific region, but the, I, I get the sense as an observer of Indian foreign policy that there is, uh, at least with the new foreign secretary, uh, Vijay Gokhale in India, a sense that uh, India-China relations need to be maintained on some sort of an even keel. Uh, there was recently news of a memo that he issued uh, suggesting that Indian officials and ministers keep off some of the Tibetan events, and that was clearly an effort to um, uh, not uh, raise extraneous issues with the Chinese uh, or to play the so-called uh, Tibet card. And, um, uh, uh, you know, broadly speaking, if I were to conclude, I would say that like many countries in, uh, in East Asia and in the uh, Indo-Pacific region as a whole, uh, uh, even as countries are apprehensive about the rise of China and uh, do not regard uh, the new turn in Chinese foreign policy as at all a positive development, uh, they do not want to be in a position where you have to choose between uh, the US and China. Uh, the, uh, there is a sense in which the Trump approach to the Quad and the Indo-Pacific region is uh, somewhat of a uh, somewhat of a zero-sum game. You cannot, as as, as Michael Swain argued uh, recently in the piece for for, for Carnegie, uh, you cannot, on the one hand, talk of the need for a free and open Indo-Pacific region, uh, which is the phrase that the Americans use, or a phrase that the Indians use, which is open and inclusive architecture in in Asia, on the one hand, and then uh, create. Uh, forums or instrumentalities or architecture that in some ways is, is designed to keep the Chinese out. Uh, and I think this is a fundamental contradiction that, uh, that, in, that many Indian analysts are now are trying, to, trying to address that, uh, uh, that you need to obviously deal with the uh, ugly aspects of, of China's rise, uh, particularly the manner in which China is accentuating its border conflicts with various countries and India uh, knows that more than anybody else, but uh, uh, these have to be addressed in a way that does not lead to uh, new divisions or more permanent divisions, uh, and certainly uh, not in a situation where there is continuing uncertainty, because one of the big factors uh, with, with India-US uh, relations is the, the, the lack of continuity. So in, in a sense, the idea that US relations towards India, even in the Bush years, were in some ways derivative of how the U.S. dealt with China. And central to that idea was that if U.S.-China relations improve, uh, uh, what happens to the, to the U.S.-India relationship then? And I think that uh, for, 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 this, for this reason and a lot of other factors having to do with uh, uh, you know, the inability of the U.S. to address or resolve uh, various conflicts in the Asia-Pacific region, region by itself, uh, India, uh, India's interests lie perhaps in uh, an architecture that is genuinely inclusive uh, and, in, uh, and inclusive on the ground rather than merely at the level of uh, rhetoric. Thank you very much.